cleanup of environmental hazards at the Department of Energy's Oak Ridge site is an issue that affects us all. DOE is working to address the issue, but it needs citizen input. One way you can help is to take part in the meetings of the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board, a volunteer citizens panel. By attending meetings, you can learn about the cleanup program and voice your opinions. Join us in making our area an even better place to live. For more information, call toll-free or visit us online. I'd like to start off by welcoming everyone to the October Site-Specific Advisory Board meeting. I'm going to go over a few items of protocol and then make a few announcements. Uh, first of all, we do encourage participation from the public. We do ask that you sign in at the front registry, that you wear your name tags, and that you use the microphone for questions. There is an emergency exit at the rear of the building, down the stairs to the right. If should, in the event of an emergency, if you need assistance exiting the building, please contact the staff or anyone close to you who can help you. Uh, members should use their name tents to be recognized, and during the presentation question and answer period, uh, the board members will be approached first for the questions, and then the public. The next meeting will be November 9th, and the presentation will focus on the ORNL hot cell cleanup. Tonight's meeting presentation will be by Dave Adler, and it will be an update on the Bear Creek burial grounds. At this point, we are going to go to introduction of several new members, and that will be by Sue Kange, who is the new Oak Ridge Acting Assistant Manager for EM. Sue? Good evening, everybody. Um, I wanted to welcome two new members who are joining us tonight. The first is Howard Holmes. Welcome, Howard. Howard is a physician with Mercy Primary Care in Lenore City, so we're very glad to have you. And our other uh, new member tonight is Thomas Falunis. Right. Don't call me Tom. Tom. Okay. Very good, Tom. Tom is retired. He's retired in 2009 from Mid-America Renewable Fuels, Inc., where he served as their chief financial officer. So welcome, Tom. We're glad to have you. Okay, great. So um, that's it for our, our new members tonight. I thought that I might take this opportunity just to talk about a few things, bring you guys up to date with, with what I know, or a little bit of what I know anyway. Um, uh, first, um, as Maggie mentioned, there, there's been a few personnel changes, so I just wanted to um, let everybody know, I'm sure you've read this uh, in the paper, that John Eschenberg is now the acting manager for the Oak Ridge office. And so uh, John has moved over to the federal building. Um, he's been sitting over there for, for several months, but he's um, going to be uh, very involved now on a broader scale, not only uh, supporting and helping with environmental management, but also the Office of Science activities um, and the Office of Nuclear Energy activities here on the reservation. So of course we, we wish John a lot of luck and uh, we'll be supporting him. And then, um, I, as Maggie mentioned, I've moved in to be the acting assistant manager for environmental management. So I'm uh, very excited about the challenge that lays before me, and I look forward to uh, working more closely with all of you as time goes on uh, to assist DEM with, with our mission. Um, I also wanted to mention a little bit about the budget. I'm sure you all uh, know that we're in a continuing resolution. And that continuing resolution is um, in effect at least until mid-November. I believe it's the 18th um, is the date that, that Congress has approved it for. Um, things are, are not really uh, seriously impacted for the environmental management program uh, during this time. We're continuing with execution of all of the projects that are underway. And so we, uh, at this time, do not anticipate any real impacts and are uh, cautiously optimistic, I guess, that there will be some sort of bill um, before the holidays to allow us to, to function with our, our uh, full funding. Um, also, uh, I wanted to mention um, the status of a couple of our projects that are underway. I think you all might be familiar with what we call either Core Hole 8 or Tank W1A at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. 
Um, this project um, has started, so we just recently uh, were successful in starting um, construction of that job, which basically uh, deals with excavation of contaminated soils and a large in-ground tank will be removed as well. And we have successfully shipped our first box of material out west for disposal. So that project is well underway and so far so good, no problems there. Um, I also wanted to mention that we recently completed one of our Recovery Act projects, the demolition of Building K-33. Um, we just, uh, in the past week or so, completed disposition of the material from the building at the on-site landfill, the EMWMF. So we're now working on the second phase of that project, which involves slabs and soils. And uh, that work has started without any um, interruption. So, so we're very pleased about that progress as well. The last couple things I'll mention are a couple of opportunities for uh, you all to participate if you're interested. First, uh, next week on October 18th, DOE here in Oak Ridge is having a Recovery Act celebration. It's going to be over in uh, Building 2714, which is the offices where EM is located, um, right across the lawn from the Federal Office Building. It is um, a combined celebration for the Office of Environmental Management, the Office of Science, and the National Nuclear Security Administration um, for us to celebrate all of our successes with the Recovery Act money. So it goes on from 9 to 11, basically. Several of our contractors will be there that have participated in Recovery Act work, and they'll have some exhibits up, and there'll be some pictures and some films and you know a few kind words about the work that's been done. So that's again on October 18th from 9 to 11. And you all, of course, are welcome to attend if you're interested or available. And um, the other meeting that's on the calendar that you all are welcome to attend if you're interested is a meeting that we have scheduled with the consulting parties for historic preservation, in particular the K-25 building. That's been uh, scheduled for November 3rd at 9 a.m., again, uh, in the same location across the hall to a smaller conference room, but it's 2714, the meeting places. So that's also um, been scheduled, and uh, if you all are interested, of course, you're welcome to attend. So that's it in terms of my announcements. Are there any questions? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. At this point, we'll move on to our comments from our DOE, EPA, and TDAC liaisons, and we'll start with Dave Adler. I don't have to add this month. Okay. Are there any questions for Dave? Okay, we'll move on to Connie Jones with EPA. Thank you. I don't have any announcements either, but I'll be more than happy to attempt to answer questions if asked. Thank you. Okay, John. I, I do have an announcement. Uh, the uh, Division of Water Pollution Control uh, asked that uh, I uh, inform the board that uh, the Y-12 per MPDS wastewater discharge permit uh, a, uh, a notice of determination and a response to comments uh, are expected to be issued by the end of the month and uh, that will be made available on the uh, division's uh, website, the Division of Water Pollution Control's website and uh, for those that requested uh, written copies uh, uh, they will be mailed to those individually. So if you're, if you're interested and you requested a copy, you should be receiving it uh, before the end of the month. Uh, and uh, if you haven't requested a copy, it is available. Uh, and uh, uh, if you don't care to uh, check the website and haven't requested a, a, a written copy, I'll see what I can do about providing one as well. Are there any questions for John? Thank you. At this point, we'll move on to the public comment period, and Amira Sakala will give the guidelines for that. The public comment period is now open. Um, Norman Mulvinen, please state your name and keep your comments to three minutes.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Norman Mulvennan. I am still the chairman of the Local Oversight Committee Citizens Advisory Panel. And uh, we're moving along on that issue. And we'll probably resolve it on Friday. Um, I'm, uh, first of all, I'd really like to congratulate Sue Kange for being the acting uh, head of the EM this time. Is a, not a first for, she's not the first woman, but she's the, uh, remember Lori, uh, she was acting too. I can't remember her name now, Lori something. <laughs> she did make a big impression on me like Sue did. <laughs> it was a long time ago. It was a long time ago, that's right. Uh, this is a big deal because uh, we're, uh, we've got two of our, our, we got our former act, our former member mem, manager of the EM group is now heading the reservation up, and Sue is uh, going to be here with environmental management, and the two of them together and all of us together are going to win this deal. We're going to clean it up quick. The other thing I'd like to point out, though, is that that's the good news. The bad news is that I'm really disappointed about the. Uh, about the hot cells in 3026. They're sitting out there in the weather at the lab. And I know we're going to hear about this next week, but a little birdie busted in my ear yesterday that, uh, that uh, they don't have any money. And that's too bad, because those things are really going to be dangerous here pretty soon. Let's see, I think that's all. Thank you very much. Are, they, are there any other members of the public who want to comment? As a Citizens Advisory Board, the Department of Energy on Environmental Cleanup, we want to encourage the community at large to attend and participate on our board and committee meetings. If you are unable to attend, please send in your questions and comments to the address shown. Appropriate comments and questions will be read during the public comment period section of the SSAB meeting and will be given the same consideration by the board and DOE as those given in person. Meeting schedules and various ways to communicate with the ORSSAB can be obtained by calling 241-4583 or 241-4584 or by visiting our website. Thank you. Question, Ron? Yes, really. For, for Dave, the, the meeting on 3 November is the purpose of that meeting is? That, that meeting is required under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. It's the provision allowing for consultation with interested stakeholders. It essentially is the public That's meeting was on, at, that is on the, that matter. Yeah. Um, prior to that meeting, DOE will issue a draft mitigation plan basically the document that says what DOE proposes to do to commemorate the history of the K-25 building, and a draft, something called a memorandum of, of agreement, which is a document signed between DOE, the state, <coughs> an organization called the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. So those will come out at least two weeks ahead of the meeting. We'll hold the meeting. If we're very close at that point, that could be the last meeting held on the subject. We might proceed from there to sign an MOA and, and move on. If there are significant changes that evolve as a consequence of that meeting, it's possible there would be a second meeting. Okay, thank you. If there are no other questions, go ahead, Norm. I forgot the consulting parties meeting, and uh, that's a big deal, too. Uh, I hope that there's going to be participation. I know there will be one from Steve Stowe will probably be attending. And there may be others. I went to the first consulting party meeting when it was uh, from this group. I was a member of this group then. And this is really a big deal, people, because this is where the, the, the everybody gets to participate in Determining what's going to happen at K-25 as a way of the National Historic Preservation Act. So this is really a big thing. 
I'd like to encourage anybody who can come along to observe would be would be very welcome and uh, see what happens. This is going to be government in action. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, we'll go to item number six on your agenda, and it will be the motion section of this meeting, and we will start with Ed Juarez. Oh, we did miss the presentation. I did not forget about you, Dave. Well, sorry, you know, you know, no, 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 you're not going to get off that easy. Okay, we will do our presentation by Dave Adler on the update on Bear Creek Valley. Hello again, everybody. Um, a couple, actually a few months ago, the SSAB provided a recommendation to DOE on a burial ground called the Bear Creek Burial Grounds. Um, we think it's going to be in your interest for us to come back to you on that in two phases since there are a lot of new members on the board um, and this issue hasn't been touched on for a while. We thought it made sense to give one presentation that kind of gets everybody up to the same knowledge level on the subject to talk to you about what we're going to do about your recommendation and then to come back a little bit later on when we've got some more analysis done. So. Tonight I'm going to talk just a little bit about the history of the Bear Creek Burial Grounds, the history of cleanup actions, or the history of uh, attempts at decision making on the burial grounds, the history of cleanup actions, and the likely path forward for the Bear Creek Burial Grounds. Okay, for anybody that doesn't know yet, um, let's see, does this have a pointer? Yeah. We're around here, out in the city of Oak Ridge. The gray area is the Oak Ridge Reservation. Y12 is located right here. And the Bear Creek Burial Grounds are located just west of Y-12, fairly interior to the reservation, about a mile west of Y-12 and several miles from the western boundary of the Oak Ridge Reservation. Zooming in, um, the Bear Creek Valley area actually has been used for waste management by, well, by uh, Y-12 since the Manhattan Project. It's the area west of Y-12 where they took all their waste for years and years and years from the 40s up into the 90s. Um, three basic features I'd like to point out. Again, oh, sorry about that. Let's go back. The Y-12 plant is an 800-acre industrialized facility right here. That's kind of the last of the industrial facilities. Right here is a major closed waste management unit called the S3 Ponds. The S3 Ponds are part of the Bear Creek Valley network of waste management units. They received liquid waste from the Y-12 plant, highly acidic and uranium and nitrate bearing liquid waste. They were closed back in the 80s. They stirred some cementitious material into the sludge, poured in a bunch of rock, and put a very elaborate capping system over the top of them so that they've now been closed under a federal statute called RICRA, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Though they've been closed, we have not dealt with groundwater issues associated with the S3 ponds. So they are one of three areas that contribute, three general areas that contribute some contamination to groundwater and to Bear Creek itself. Bear Creek, by the way, starts pretty much, its headwaters are just 10, 20 feet from these S3 ponds, and Bear Creek generally runs down the valley on out to off the reservation. Okay, a second area is an area known as the oil land farm, OLF, and this is a sanitary landfill. This is our new modern waste disposal facility. It's the only active waste disposal facility in Bear Creek Valley. And a third area, the area we're focusing on tonight, is referred to as the Bear Creek Burial Grounds. The Bear Creek Burial Grounds are actually a collection of disposal trenches and pits. Um, nothing very high-tech about the Bear Creek Burial Grounds. Again, run from the 40s up until the early 90s. Um, trench disposal, I'll show you some pictures in a minute. But this is the area that has been the focus of uh, EPA and TDEC and DOE for a few years because it's, it explains most of the contamination that continues to leach into groundwater and run downstream via Bear Creek. Again, closing in, the last, this is the last zoom in on the Bear Creek Burial Grounds, but to give you a sense of what matters here, as I mentioned, we have a large number of formal, former burial areas in the Bear Creek Burial Grounds. They are all now inactive. They've been subjected to various types of caps. 
Some of the areas have been subjected to these multi-layer caps involving plastic and clay and a very, very low permeability. Some have just been covered with clay and some are basically just covered with soil. They really don't have much of a barrier to rainwater infiltration. The primary environmental challenge at the Bear Creek Burial Grounds involves material that's leaching from this general area into this little intermittent stream. They call it NT8. That stands for Northern Tributary 8 because it comes off the northern side of Bear Creek Valley into the main stream of Bear Creek. And what we've been asked to do both by the SSAB and by <laughs> EPA and TDEC is to look at interim measures, relatively low cost, quick fixes that we might implement to reduce the flux of contamination into NT8 pending a holistic comprehensive solution for the Bear Creek burial grounds. Okay, a couple quick pictures. Um, this picture actually isn't that old. It's from the 80s um, and it shows you what trench disposal looks like. Nothing too pretty. This device back here um, was set up to throw a big bucket and a drag line that it would drag across the ground and dig in, dig a trench about 15 feet deep, and then basically a lot of unregulated material was ingloriously thrown into the trench. It was covered with soil, um, and that was it. That was the, basically the, the established <laughs> practice for disposal of this type of material back in the 80s. I think you know that now our disposal practices are very, very different. There is no unlined disposal anywhere on the reservation. It's all done in very elaborate, fancy landfills that are set up to not leak. But that's how it was done back then, and that's a picture of it. Here's a picture also just down the hill from the area I've been focusing on, but it's an area that suffered from contamination from up the hill. Uh, one of the practices back in that time frame was to actually dispose of liquid organic materials, primarily cutting fluids, uh, waste oils, and solvents, um, in standpipes, basically tubes that were drilled down into the ground. They would pour the waste material into these standpipes and it would diffuse out into the interstitial space between the bulky waste that had already been disposed of in the trenches. Um, so in effect, you were taking a problem that was above ground and transferring it to below ground. Uh, that worked for a while, but as you might imagine, over time, those waste oils found their way back up to the surface down at the bottom of the hill um, and would work their way into streams. Now, again, this is a practice that's been completely discontinued. That type of material today would either be recycled or incinerated, but this is how it was done back then. This is an area they dug out to try and prevent excessive leaching into the stream. It was called the oil retention pond. Um, it has been cleaned up. We have removed the liquid contents. They dug out the oiliest of soils. Um, they are now up in a basically a concrete bermed area awaiting final disposition. But this, this eyesore and this environmental problem is gone. I noticed there's a little splash right there, and I don't know what that is. <laughs> I doubt it's a cutthroat trout going after a stonefly. Um, OK, this is what the Bear Creek burial grounds look like today. Um, there has been a fair amount of stabilization activity that's taken place in the burial grounds. As I mentioned, there have been different types of caps that have been put in place. In one area of the burial grounds, where you see this white material, that's actually where after putting a, an impermeable cap onto the burial grounds, they put a blanket that, had, uh, that they could infuse concrete into. So they basically have now created a concrete blanket over the Bear Creek burial grounds. The reason, or at least over a portion of it, a portion referred to often as the walk-in pits. The reason they did that is because the material that was placed into those burial grounds actually had some, uh, some of it was shock sensitive or pyrophoric. So they wanted to make sure if there's any type of energetic reaction in that area, it didn't have the capability of, of having a surface impact. So they've got this concrete blanket on the top. I never give a presentation on the Bear Creek Burial Grounds without showing this slide because it's one of my favorites. That's actually an armored bulldozer that was used to put the clay cap over these walk-in pits I was just describing. It was specially designed and constructed, fabricated to make sure that the worker was kept safe. Um, okay, so to summarize very briefly, that's the pre 
1997-ish history of the Bear Creek Burial Grounds. Large quantities of disposal, first cut measures taken to prevent infiltration of rainwater through the burial grounds, but by and large, everything left in place. Um, that does leave us with some contamination to groundwater and some leaching to streams. I'll give you a more quantitative sense of the significance of that as we move through the presentation. But I want to talk now a little bit about the attempts to make a decision on what to do with what's left in the Bear Creek Burial Grounds. Um, I'm not going to walk word through word through this, but it's a fairly simple story. In the late 90s, we set out working with the EPA and TDEC to come up with a record of decision defining all environmental cleanup requirements for all of Bear Creek Valley, from the S3 ponds to the east all the way out to the Bear Creek burial grounds to the west. And we were partially successful. Um, we did come up with a proposed approach for dealing with the S3 ponds, which has been partially successful. We, pro we proposed and have since executed some actual excavation actions for an old disposal area that was particularly uh, tough on the stream because of its proximity to the stream, an area called the Boneyard Burnyard. And we dug all that up, and that was actually the first waste stream that went into our new modern on-site disposal facility. But what we didn't do is come up with a remedy for the Bear Creek burial grounds, that collection of burial areas to the western end of Bear Creek Valley. Um, basically, collectively, DOE and EPA uh, stalled out, in effect, over the tough issue of what to do with about 18 million kilograms of uranium. The options that were under consideration ranged from isolating the material in place to excavating it. I'll give you some cost estimates on all that in a minute. The state, in particular, had concerns about leaving the material in place without some type of long-term post-closure care <coughs> financial assurance. DOE was having a tough time wrestling with what to do without, what, about that. So a decision was made to defer a final decision for the Bear Creek Burial Grounds. Go ahead and make decisions for the general area. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Make decisions for the S3 ponds, make decisions for the Boneyard Burnyard area but the Bear Creek Burial Grounds were left. What to do about the Bear Creek Burial Grounds was left unsettled. Um, to make a long story short, we tried again in 2008, and that process has not yet led to a decision either. So then very recently, in the 2000, late 2010, early 11 time frame, uh, concurrently, EPA and TDEC and the SSAB told DOE, hey, if you can't make the big decision on what to do about the burial grounds at large, perhaps you can come up with some interim fixes that will help drive down contaminant flux from the burial grounds into the creek. And that's what we're going to do. In 2012, we're doing an analysis of alternatives to look at lower cost, hopefully, nearer term measures that might be implementable at the Bear Creek burial grounds. Uh, you made a recommendation to us to do that. We said we would do that. We agreed to come back to you with a list of conceptual alternatives, a list of the costs and expected performance of those alternatives so that we can continue the discussion about what to do about the Bear Creek Burial Grounds. Okay. The very first record of decision that was signed, and this is kind of an important perspective, did succeed in laying out land use objectives for all of Bear Creek Valley. What we decided was that in this area, the eastern portion of the valley, where all of the existing burial grounds, including the new on-site disposal facility, are located, we decided to not attempt to restore that to a very aggressive standard. We recognized that the costs and practical considerations would require that that area be left in perpetuity in a DOE controlled setting and fairly significant restrictions on land use in that area are anticipated. Cleanup goals mirror that. We proposed an intermediate buffer area, we call it Zone 2, that begins basically just west of the Bear Creek Burial Grounds where our objective would be to meet recreate, to create conditions compatible with recreational use. Someone would be able to fish and play and swim and carry on as a recreator just west of the Bear Creek Burial Grounds in an area that's about a mile long here. And then for the rest of the valley, our objective was to 
hit conditions that were compatible with totally unrestricted use. So a very ambitious, basically make it the way it was before Y12 and DOE ever existed on the reservation. And that's what we were striving for for most of Bear Creek Valley. We have partially met those goals. Um, I'll give you some information now that gives you a little bit more uh, specifically that slide so I don't need to get to because I'm going to go straight to this one. Um, basically, I'm not going to walk through these things individually, but when we looked at comprehensive alternatives for the Bear Creek Burial Grounds, what we realized is that you've really got options that exist along a continuum, ranging from full excavation, everything, that would be the lower right-hand corner one, anything that's blue gets dug up, to in-place management, through a combination of measures, including caps on the surface, trenches upgrading of the burial grounds that would divert groundwater before it flows through the waste, possibly some they call in situ vitrification, where you actually infuse concrete or heat the material up and turn it into a glass-like state to solidify the waste within the ground, and a lot of combinations of those different things. Um, the next slide gives a sense of what those different things cost. And again, now I'm still talking about a comprehensive solution. It gives, this will give you a sense of why it's been difficult to make a decision. One option that basically focuses on caps and diverting water away from the burial grounds that DOE believes would probably be pretty effective runs in at about $21 million. No small amount of money, but nothing compared to the other end of the spectrum. Oh, rats, sorry about that where you excavate everything, and it costs in the range of $3 billion. So the stakes on this decision are very, very high. In fact, it's, it's the last burial ground on the Oak Ridge Reservation, um, significant burial ground on the reservation that needs to have its first decision, big decision made on it. Um, and the costs of the various alternatives being considered are just swing from not terribly significant to very, very significant. So naturally, uh, well, as you might expect, DOE being concerned about getting as much as it can for the dollars we spend in environmental cleanup was most interested in the, the lower end of that spectrum because we believe it would likely yield a protective remedy. The state, understandably, is not eager to have 42 million pounds of uranium perpetually left in the state of Tennessee. Uranium is one of those radionuclides that lasts essentially forever. It's got a half-life in the billions of years. So it's a tough decision. OK. So next, I'm going to talk about the environmental problem that remains. Because I, I think it's important before we decide how to, and when to spend money to have some understanding of the actual environmental problem we're trying to solve. Fortunately, the environmental problem we're trying to solve is not very severe. This is a slide that uh, comes from our environmental monitoring efforts on the reservation, and it shows what the various uh, 8, 9, and 10 yielded in terms of groundwater that flowed past what we call the integration point, which is the eastern edge of that recreational buffer zone I talked about, very close to the burial grounds. The numbers have varied over in 8, 9, and 10 from about 70 kilograms a year to about 120. They've gone up and down. Um, for a while we thought they were going up, but now they appear to be going back down again. One thing that we do see is that NT8, that small intermittent stream that flows right from the heart of the Bear Creek Burial Grounds, is a big contributor to what we see in Bear Creek. Um, this is another slide that breaks it down into more detail, and anybody that wants to understand it better can talk to me, but I'm not going to spend time on it. This is a slide that I think really useful in understanding the actual risk. Okay, now instead of describing uranium releases in terms of kilograms per year, we're talking about the actual concentrations of uranium that are present in the stream at various locations. And of course, how dangerous the stream is, is a function of the concentration found in the stream. And what we see, let's see, basically for point of reference, these, these units are micrograms per liter. What probably helps everyone understand it better is that about 30 micrograms per liter is the Safe Drinking Water Act standard for uranium. So water coming out of the water fountain around the corner here can have up to 30 micrograms per liter 
under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Okay? Um, those standards, strictly speaking, aren't applicable to streams out on the Oak Ridge Reservation. But it's a useful point of reference. Obviously, if it's safe enough to serve up in a water fountain, that should be safe enough for a stream in the middle of the Oak Ridge Reservation, too. Um, what we see is where the creek basically gets out well into the public domain, the first place you can drive without having a badge around your neck, we're below drinking water standards. It is measurable. That surprised me a little bit. It is measurable. It's, it's 10 to 50 times above what you'd expect in a background quality stream, but it's still well below our drinking water standards. Um, right about at the edge of the burial grounds, we run at about a little less than twice the drinking water standard. Um, so, you know, even when you get right up close to the burial grounds, you're very close to an acceptable level. But then when you get back up into the burial grounds, you're well above the drinking water standard. And somewhere in here, yeah, that one, this is NT8 again. Remember, that's the one that flows directly from the burial grounds. You're about 10 times the drinking water standard. So I think the take-home measure from this slide is pretty good shape in western Bear Creek Valley. A couple of focused areas where we have opportunity to drive contamination down. If we could hit this one and make a significant difference on it, we'd probably approach drinking water standards in the stream at the toe of the burial area. Okay, what ideas do we have for doing that? Um, and these are the alternatives that we'll be looking at over the next several months, trying to attach some cost and engineering assessment information to, to bring back to you to discuss again. One idea we have is basically to go to an existing sump at the toe of the Bear Creek Burial Grounds. There actually already is a collection system at the bottom of the hill below the Burial Grounds that was set up to capture leach that flows from the Bear Creek Burial Grounds. That water is collected, sent to a treatment plant, and discharged under uh, Clean Water Act permits. But those sumps have fallen into some, a little bit of disrepair. They're, they're not flowing easily. They've got uh, roots and uh, soil and just build up in them that prevents them from drawing water out, allowing it to be captured and treated as well as they did when they were first created. So one simple option would be to clean out those sumps and see if we can't do a little bit better job of just capturing the water right at the base of the facility, of the burial grounds. Second option is to collect a little bit further down surface water or groundwater in NT8, simply treat the stream. Um, that idea sounds simple enough, but the problem probably is that after a rainstorm, the volume of water picks up appreciably and instead of having a water treatment plant that might have to deal with a trickle, literally if you went out there, well not today, but a few days ago, NT8 would be barely wet. There's essentially no flow. It's an intermittent stream. At times it actually dries up, but at times it flows real well. Um, so building a treatment system for the creek itself may be challenging, but we'll evaluate that as part of our engineering analysis underway. Another idea is to basically begin the process of capping and covering the source areas so as to prevent water from leaching down into those source areas, reduce the amount of water that's transferred through the waste and that ends up in the stream, in the intermittent stream, and then down in Bear Creek itself. Just a few more ideas that we've had. All the ideas you guys can come up with are welcome. but. Another idea would be to go into some of the source trenches. We know that there are a select number of those trenches that have the highest concentration of uranium, that are in closest proximity to groundwater, and that serve as the principal sources of groundwater contamination. So if we were to move into those trenches and grout them up or do something to immobilize material in those trenches, conceptually that would be a way of reducing flux, contaminant flux to groundwater. Another idea would be to drill wells beneath these focused areas that we know to be sources and simply depress the groundwater table so there's less interaction between the waste and the groundwater, presenting less opportunity for transfer. And then, of course, we can always go back to all the literally 
tens of thousands of dollars worth of studies we've already done on comprehensive alternatives and see if there's anything useful we can mine from that. Um, now again, this, these are the basic proposed engineering alternatives that we're going to propose to EPA and the state. Uh, they may have some additional ideas and we'll throw them on the hopper and complete engineering studies on them and have them done sometime this spring to talk about some more. Okay, last slide. Um, again, the summary, I think, is that right now there is no significant risk in the Bear Creek burial grounds because no one goes up and consumes the water that is up there in certain areas at about 10 times the drinking water standard. So we're preventing risk through use restrictions. Um, if somehow DOE were to disappear, that land were to become developed, we were to take no additional actions to <coughs> prevent releases, then conceivably if someone elected to drink out of Bear Creek rather than tap into municipal water supplies, there could be an exposure, but it's a very assumption-driven hypothetical risk. It may be that some of these ideas we've discussed for a relatively small amount of dump money, if it were down in the single digit millions, uh, might be worth doing. That's what we're going to look into, to see if some of these quick focus fixes would have significant benefit at low cost. That may be what we figure out over the next several months. Um, results from those studies should happen this spring. It's also possible that the results from these studies will show us that the quick fixes cost 10, 15 million dollars, whereas the comprehensive fix, at least the lower end ones, the lower cost ones, were more in the 20 million dollar range. So if, you know, if we end up in a situation where for, we can do a patch job, if you will, for 15 million dollars, but a very thorough and complete remedy for 20, then we have to start thinking about the wisdom of just doing the small job when for a little bit more money you could probably put in a much more enduring and permanent remedy. And then there's the obligatory comment about how it's tough times. Even if we find something that could be done for 10 or $5 million, we still have to think about where this work fits into our priorities across the reservation. You know, we, we cannot lose sight of the fact that this is well interior to the reservation, presents no off-site risk to speak of, um, whereas if you just head east a couple miles, we have mercury flowing right out of the uh, Y-12 plant at levels that exceed Clean Water Act levels, and I could go on. There are, other, there are other environmental challenges on the Oak Ridge Reservation, and we're in a very, very tight fiscal environment for the next few years. So it is possible that even after we've done these evaluations, we may have found some relatively low cost fixes for the Bear Creek burial grounds, but we would still elect to basically continue to monitor them and maintain them in the status quo situation simply because they aren't the highest priority. So that's the backdrop. We'll come in with some hard numbers for people to look at in spring, and now I'll try and answer any questions that people might have. Okay. Is the contamination in the water caused by flowing by it, or is it actually carrying some of the source with it? Or it's largely contamination that is that gets into groundwater and then wells up into the stream. It's not a situation where you have a creek eroding a a uranium contaminated matrix and those eroded soils falling into the tree, stream and going downstream. It's more transfer to groundwater and upwelling. Okay, so the source is pretty much staying where it is. Yes. Yeah, it's got, it's pretty much capped off and vegetated. Um, I'll just start picking people. Dave. Uh, David, you mentioned <clears throat> that this is not one of the higher priorities. Has, has DOE established a priority list of what they would like to have done if the funding were adequate? I haven't seen that. Yeah, I, I should stop short of saying it's not a priority. Um, we're in the process right now of working with the state and EPA to decide what our priorities are. Um, DOE and the state and EPA could have different priorities. You know, our priority is uh, perhaps more heavily impacted by total project cost considerations or by uh, worker safety considerations back on the industrial facilities where we have thousands of workers. Um, by, by law, 
EPA and TDEC are charged with protecting the environment. So contaminated streams and groundwater are a very high priority for them. They're, they're a priority for us too, but so we're, we're working through that discussion right now. Okay. But is there an opportunity for some kind of a list or a priority yeah. to be it, developed in the near mm -hmm. year or Yeah, <laughs> every year when DOE submits its budget, it actually submits DOEs, a list actually called the IPL, the something priority list. It, well, it basically shows if you'll give us, you know, it lists things in order of priority by DOE's value system mm -hmm. and says if you give us this much money, we can do everything above the line. If you give us that much more, we can do that much more. But what we're trying to do is to work with the regulators to make sure that what we submit to headquarters reflects a reasonable compromise of everyone's values. Thank you. Sure. Great. Yeah, Dave. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned they've been using this since the 40s. Mm -hmm. And the first pretty colored picture showed about nine football-sized areas, roughly. Yeah. Okay. Do they have good records of what all was stuck there, or is there going to be a Achilles heel surprise pop they, up in there? They actually have surprisingly good records. And the reason they have good records is because all of this material was coming from a defense facility whose principal mission was producing quantities of a highly regulated material internally regulated that they had to maintain a very high degree of accountability on. So they actually, I've actually seen the records. They're publicly available aside from. No, from but there are no surprises that are going to pop up. Okay. That you're, Let me not overstate. You're not, you're not anticipating it. <laughs> Whenever you dig into a burial ground, there are always surprises. And the, uh, they do have a good inventory. By trench, they can tell you plus or minus, you know, a thousand pounds how much material was disposed of. They and had a pretty good handle. And what kind of material? And what kind of material was put there. Yeah, I, I, it's pretty impressive what kind of record keeping they did back then. Good. A lot more than you would expect to see probably in any, any other industrial disposal setting from that time frame, municipal or, or industrial disposal setting. That helps us when we try to solve a problem. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, David, isn't it true that, it, that while it says that currently no unacceptable risk to human health is estimated in Berkeley, right? it, it, isn't it tr true, though, that, that the, that the uh, contaminants in Bear Creek exceed the rod limits but not the drinking water standards? They do exceed the performance goals that we laid out in that first record of decision. They're marginally higher than what we set as our performance goals in that rod. Now, that's... That's uh, not a unique situation in, uh, at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and in Milton Valley and at Y12. We've set goals and records of decision that were signed in most cases about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And for each of them, we're still working to hit those goals, making steady progress, but not there yet. Um, but yes, we do have levels that exceed what we've committed to getting to in binding formal agreements with the state and EPA. And the, and the state and EPA's position on not achieving those standards. They want us to get there. Are, you know, they, they want us to get there. And, and, and in addition to not meeting that goal, there are a couple of very limited stretches of the stream which intermittently exceed something called ambient water quality criteria, um, which are Clean Water Act standards established specifically for the protection of aquatic life. So. You know, and the aquatic life, of course, doesn't pay any attention to our signs. So there are, you know, critters that are in a setting that is not quite what it should be. Um, overall, biota in the stream has recovered dramatically since, you know, the, before any of these measures started being implemented, the upper third of uh, Bear Creek was abiotic. There, was, there were no living things in it. Now there are minnows and, uh, you know, benthic invertebrates and such. But there's still some work to do. Connie? I'd just like to, I think, try to respond to your inquiry, Ron, about what we, what EPA's position, I'm going to speak for John, in terms of the longevity of not achieving those performance goals. Unfortunately, there are some decisions that are on the shelves that were assigned where they may have had performance goals, but we did not have the time frame to achieve those, and this may be one of them. And those are some things we really have to 
kind of tighten up on. So that's a problem with this ride specifically. We do have a performance goal, but we didn't have the time frame for achievement. And a ride signed today won't have that. So I think in, in evaluating through the five-year review and the RER and, and our headquarters and IG looking at what we do, how we do business, there may be some opportunities to try to look at that. And that's one of the reasons why um, at least EPA I think TDEC has continually brought these, this issue to the board in terms of um, issues we wanted you to address. Anything else? No. Okay. Good enough. Thanks, Dave. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Dave. We appreciate that. And I'm glad I actually gave you the opportunity to give your presentation. <laughs> I'll try to stick to the agenda. Next, we will move on to item number five, and I'll ask are there any additions to the agenda at this time? If not, we'll approve the agenda as is. Now we'll go to item number six, motions, and I will turn it over to Mr. Ed Juarez. Yes, I have reviewed the uh, meeting minutes of September 14, 2011, and find them to be inaccurate reflection of what transpired and I move that the me meeting minutes be approved. I second it. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Thank you. On the, uh, this is the second reading of uh, the review of our uh, bylaws. If you recall, this is on section, for our bylaws, uh, section five, under D8, we've changed it to read, except for the board finance and process and executive committee, non-onboard members shall be allowed to vote in committee meetings, but shall not hold committee leadership positions. And the next uh, change, is under item I-1. We inserted the word or between vice chair and secretary. It reads, a board officer vacancy, chair, vice chair, or secretary. This concludes the second reading. I move that the, uh, that the changes uh, be approved. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Okay, now we will move to Steve Stowe, who will be giving his recommendation to automate the stewardship verification process for the remediation effectiveness report. Thank you. I should not be terribly long here. I'm going to ask that you consider a recommendation and hopefully vote to pass it. The recommendation deals with one coming out of the stewardship committee and uh, deals with the automation of stewardship verification process for the RER, which is the Remediation Effectiveness Report. By way of background, and you've heard this before, uh, every year DOE Water Resources Restoration Program prepares an RER, uh, Restoration Report, which assesses the progress of remedial actions towards stated goals and compares pre- and post-remedial conditions at cleaned up sites throughout the reservation. This is a circular requirement. We undertake it every year. The RER is issued every year, and every five years, a five-year review is prepared. Uh, this five-year review determines if remedies are still appropriate under current conditions, since things do change over that period of time. So there are these reports that are circular driven and are required uh, on a regular basis.
Every one of these things is different. You never know what's going to blow up. Um, at the June stewardship committee meeting, we had representatives from the Water Resources Program explain the steps involved and documented these stewardship requirements, these reports that I've referenced. The process is quite time-consuming, labor-intensive, intensive, and requires input from multiple companies and organizations. You can imagine the situation that could <coughs> evolve here because of lack of consistency across the board in all these reporting requirements. Currently, there are about 180 checklists that have to be completed by facility managers, of which there are 11 across the reservation, who are involving some 37 different sites that are being remediated. Uh, it's a complicated system, and the uh, amount of documentation is going to increase significantly as we remediate more items or sites throughout the coming years. Currently, when sites are visited to see what sort of remediation steps have been taken, a handwritten form is filled out like this. The manager, the individual who fills the form out, carries it back and enters the data into a system. What we're asking in this recommendation is that we have an integrated automated system that covers all the 180 different forms that have to be filled out at the 37 sites so that data can be entered in a rapid, consistent fashion, can be retrieved, can be cataloged, stored. If, a, if data are incomplete, then the system tells you we're not looking at a manual review of these process sheets. And on top of that, if different offices within the system need access to the data, they generally have to be resurrected in handwritten form, either emailed or faxed to the recipient. If we get into an automated system, which actually has been used or is currently being used by the Navy at a variety of different sites, then we can greatly facilitate this entire undertaking cut down on errors, lower costs, and we'll be much better off. Matter of fact, we'll be in the 21st century with this sort of approach. Basically, that's what we're saying right here. Um, recommends that the Department of Energy, Office of Water Resources Management or Program, explore ways to automate the stewardship tracking process. We are not within this recommendation specifying what method has to be used there are methods out there. I mentioned the Navy one, for instance. Uh, but we will leave it up to the uh, individuals involved with the system to actually select, to review various methods of automation and select the one that is proper for our particular environment. Um, we further recommend that the department establish web-based solution for managing long-term stewardship information on the reservation. And uh, I think it goes without saying that without this system, process could become quite overwhelming. These are actually supportive statements that I've covered to a large degree to this point. Um, ideally, the system, I didn't mention this, the system would be used for data entry during site inspections. That need not necessarily be the case, at least initially, but what we'd like to get away from are these handwritten uh, sheets that could be filled out with direct access to the system by entering the data in the field. And so based on that, we would like to ask the board to approve, discuss, and approve the recommendation that we enter into this web-based system for managing uh, the data that come out of the RER and the five-year review uh, Cleanup of environmental hazards at the Department of Energy's Oak Ridge site is an issue that affects us all. DOE is working to address the issue, but it needs citizen input. 
One way you can help is to take part in the meetings of the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board, a volunteer citizens panel. By attending meetings, you can learn about the cleanup program and voice your opinions. Join us in making our area an even better place to live. For more information, call toll-free or visit us online.